perhaps enjoyed the publicity somewhat. And gentlemen, good evening. My name is Shevket Pamuk. I'm the Professor of Contemporary <coughs> Turkish Studies here at the London School of Economics. First, I want to welcome you all for uh, uh, our main event, a lecture by Professor Justin McCarthy this evening. And I want to begin with by saying a few things about myself, about the chair of Contemporary Turkish Studies here, and then our host organization this evening, and finally, yes, I will have time to introduce our speaker. <laughs> I have been directing the Chair on Contemporary Turkish Studies here at LSE and its programs since 2008 when the Chair was launched. We have a very active program of seminars and lectures on contemporary Turkey and these uh, seminars, lectures are usually held on Monday evenings. And um, we urge you to um, Visit our website, or if you would like to leave with us your address, we'll be happy to send you, you our announcements and our program for the rest of this term. For example, just to plug in uh, one of our uh, forthcoming activities, the Turkish novelist Elif Shafak will be speaking at this very hall in two weeks from now, on the evening of Friday, February 18th, as, as part of our program and as part also of the LSE Literary Festival. If you are interested in attending that talk, please apply at the LSE website early because the tickets are likely to run out by the, time, by the day of that event. Having introduced myself and the Turkish program here at LSE, um, I would like to now introduce the hosts of this evening because the, this lecture is organized not by the Turkish chair, but by the Federation of Turkish Associations in the UK. The Federation of Turkish Associations in the UK is the umbrella organization for Turkish people in this country. This evening has been organized in memory of the Turkish diplomats who lost their lives on the line of duty. Our lecture this evening will be given by Professor Justin McCarthy of the University of Louisville in Kentucky, the United States. Professor McCarthy received his PhD degree from the University of California at Los Angeles, and he has taught at the University of Louisville for most of his academic career. He is currently a member of the Institute of Turkish Studies based in Washington, DC. Professor Justin McCarthy is well known for his many studies, books, and articles on the history and demography of the Ottoman Empire during the late 19th and early 20th century, a period when, as you all know, when the empire was disintegrating. These studies are based on the, the work he has carried out on original documents in the Ottoman archives and, and archives elsewhere. He's also a well-known expert on the question of minorities in the last years of the Ottoman Empire, including the Armenians. The title of Professor McCarthy's talk this evening is, as you see here on the board, Prejudice, Deception, and the Armenian Question. Professor McCarthy will be happy to answer questions after his talk. Ladies and gentlemen, Please give a warm welcome to Professor Justin McCarthy. Good evening. This is working all right? I told the sponsors that I can make about 150 people, but when it gets beyond that, then even my voice doesn't carry far enough. 
This evening I'm going to be talking to you about not especially what happened with the Armenian question or the troubles between Turks and Armenians. I'm going to be talking to you about why people believe all the strange things they do believe about that question. What the sources are, where the ideas come from. And in order to do that, I specifically wish to talk about not World War I, which is discussed all the time, but about the earlier part of the Armenian question, which was the 1890s. And I want to specifically concentrate on the rebellion at Sasun in eastern Turkey. Right. This was, well, how shall I put it? This is called the first genocide often, and is very commonly described in terms such as what you see from Lord Bryce here, an absolutely unprovoked massacre, all the appearance of having been deliberately planned, i.e. by the Sultan, supposedly, in order to exterminate the Christian population. So while people often talk about World War I as if that was the plan to exterminate, actually people were speaking of that 20 years before and were stating it at the time. What I'm going to look at here today are the sources for this belief where statements like this and all the statements that have come since then take place. Today there are New York Times articles, articles in various British newspapers as well, that when they go back to discuss Turkish history are based on the same kinds of sources that Bryce used here. I have seen often books that are selected, books that quote the New York Times or the London Times or various other newspapers, what they do is, they're published today, and they take certain quotations. They take the reasonable ones, the ones that look like they're written by someone who knows what they're doing. But what they've done is they have excluded the ones that really tell the story. They've excluded the ones that really give you an idea of the prejudice and the simple deception, the falseness, that comes from these quotes. All right. If all the articles are seen, if all the things that were written at the time were seen, we get a much different picture than the one we usually have. Specifically, it is a picture of something I call the canon of the Sassoon massacres. Right? In this case, what is said is, first of all, Armenians in the Sassoon region, and we'll show you a map of that in a minute, Armenians in the region were attacked by Kurds, and these Kurds stole the Armenian sheep. The Armenians then followed the Kurds, attacked them, and got their sheep back. The Kurds went to the governor in Bitlis, and they complained. They said that the Armenians are rebels and they're killing us, and the governor then sent down regular troops, and these regular troops, along with the Kurds, massacred the Armenians. The numbers that are stated for this are in the many thousands, right? Sometimes 6,000, sometimes 7,000, sometimes 12 or 16,000. The first reports of this at the time, however, the first reports that were found in Europe and in America did not consider it to be a very important thing. Specifically, here's one from our Constantinople correspondent. This is the entire reference to what happened in Sassoon. Notice, accounts have been received of destruction of 25 Armenian villages, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, the really important news, there was a great deal of interesting football. Huh? It wasn't considered to be anything particularly important. I mean, news of massacres of one sort or another were all over the newspapers. This changed with pressure from especially British groups, and a little bit later on, pressure from missionary groups in America. Specifically, the Anglo-Armenian Anglo Association and the Armenian Patriotic Association. The Anglo-Armenian Association was led by a, a British MP named, a liberal MP named Stevenson, and was founded by the same Lord Bryce that we have there before. The other organization was of Armenians who lived in Britain. Now these organizations had very good ties with the Liberal Party, and the Liberal Party had a long history, a long history of animosity against the Turks, going back, as you know, well before 1878. The Liberal Press, is sort of the organ of the Liberal Party at the time, took up the story, and the story became one that was, well, impossible to resist. All sorts of newspapers began to parrot the same tale, to give the same tale about what was going on. But at first, there was very little news, very little news from the Ottoman Empire. Our Constantinople correspondent was a man named Edwin Pears, 
who once again was someone who was noted, even though he'd lived in Turkey for quite some time, noted for his dislike of Turks. When he was asked, when he wrote actually about, the, uh, about what he thought about the Turks, Armenians and such, he said that the Armenians were vastly superior to the Turks because the Armenians were members of the Aryan race. Uh, that kind of belief was of course very common at the time. But he also said, when he was talking about how he knew what was going on with Sassoon, he stated that he had learned it from American missionaries. And this is one of the bases of the information that we received is from American missionaries. In America, the news of what supposedly happened in Sassoon came from the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. This is a missionary organization that sent missionaries to the Ottoman Empire. And the missionaries are the ones who sent back the reports. The reports from the reports that were received in America actually came usually from two sources. One was the British press. It seems that the Daily News, the primary organ of the Liberal Party actually, the Daily News was represented all over America. The Daily News was received sometimes even in galley proofs in America and was then published in American newspapers. So one source was occasionally the London Times, but usually the Daily News. And beyond that, missionaries. The missionaries were, although they were a little less seen than the Daily News articles, the missionaries were the most important because missionaries were trusted. In fact, if you look at the news that went to the United States of what was supposedly happening in Anatolia, you would find that the vast majority of articles were bylined Boston. Right? Not Sassoon, not Istanbul, not somewhere else, but the vast majority, especially in the beginning, came from Boston. And that was because Boston was the headquarters of the missionaries. Right? And consequently, the news that was received in America was primarily from missionaries. And secondhand, the news that was received in Britain was also primarily from missionaries. Right? The newspapers also printed, and in fact in the beginning printed much more often, not news that their own reporters had received, but news from these organizations like the Anglo-Armenian Association. You would much more often see not a description of what happened, but a description of what was said at a meeting. Public meetings were held, sometimes weekly public meetings were held, at which members of, members of parliament and others would address the Anglo-Armenian Association, and then this would be reported in the newspaper. And of course, these reports always said that the Turks were guilty of mass slaughter of Armenians. And this kind of thing happened, like I say, on a weekly basis and oftentimes more often. In the, well, rather than give you, you know, an extended set of quotations that you'd have to read, I want to give you some idea of what was going on in the American press. A little bit after the beginning, in the American press, the person who was most often seen, whose reports were most often seen, was the correspondent of the Associated Press. He gave, well, any number of articles in which he portrayed the Turks as fiends, basically, as people that enjoyed killing other people, and in which, of course, they were directed by their own government. And if you simply read those articles that he wrote, you would say, oh, this is, this, this is very bad. Huh? But when you look at what he actually wrote and what he actually believed, you come up with a somewhat different story. The kinds of stories that were repeated, this is the British press. I just picked a few headlines and put them down in the paper. You know? Fiendish tortures, women hacked to pieces, sickening barbarities, etc. All the news of what was generally called in America called yellow journalism at the time. If you go on, you will see American journalism as well. And uh, I haven't gone out of my way particularly to pick things that were worse than anything else. This is simply the common